White Trash by Nancy Eisenberg, the 400-year-old untold story of class in America. It was during the eugenic craze that reformers called for government incentives to ensure better breeding. This was when the idea of tax exemptions for children emerged. Theodore Roosevelt criticized the new income tax law for allowing exemptions for only two children, discouraging parents from having a third or a fourth. He wanted monetary rewards for breeding, akin to the baby bonuses established in Australia in 1912. He also promoted mothers' pensions for widows, an idea that caught on. As one defender of pensions claimed in 1918, the widowed mother was, quote, as much a servant of the state as a judge or a general. Her child-rearing duties were no less a public service than if she had toiled on the battlefield. Like selective service, which weeded out inferior soldiers, the pensions were allotted exclusively to, quote, a fit mother. Roosevelt was far from alone. Academics, scientists, doctors, journalists, and legislators all joined in the eugenics mania, as one California doctor termed the movement. Advocates believed that the way to encourage procreation of the fit was to educate the middle class on proper marriage selection. Eugenic thinking found expression in a flood of books on popular public lectures, as well as better baby and fitter family competitions at state fairs. Eugenics courses were added to college curricula. Such efforts resulted in the passage of laws imposing marriage restrictions, institutional sexual segregation of defectives, and most dramatically, state-enforced sterilization of those designated as, quote, unfit. Charles Davenport established a research facility at Long Island's Cold Spring Harbor in 1904. His facility grew into the eugenics record office. A Harvard-trained biologist and professor, Davenport, along with his team, collected inheritance data. Not surprisingly, he was also an influential member of the eugenics uh, section of the American Breeders Association, a group of agricultural breeders and biologists. This group included many prominent figures, including the famed inventor Alexander Graham Bell. Davenport's second-in-command, Harry Laughlin, became the eugenics expert for the House Committee on Immigration and Naturalization and played a crucial role in shaping the 1924 Immigration Act, one of the most sweeping and re restrictive pieces of legislation in American history. When eugenicists thought of degenerates, they automatically focused on the South. To make his point, Davenport said outright that if a federal policy regulating immigration was not put in place, New York would turn into Mississippi. In Heredity in Relation to Eugenics in 1911, he identified two breeding grounds for diseased and degenerate Americans, the hovel and the poorhouse. The hovel was familiar, whether one identified it with the cracker's cabin, the low-downer's shebang, or the poor white pigsty. Echoing James Gilmore's Down in Tennessee, 1864, Davenport's work expressed a grave concern over indiscriminate mating that occurred in isolated shacks. Brothers slept with sisters, fathers with daughters, and the fear of an inbred stock seemed very real. His attack on the poorhouse also pointed south. Mississippi did not provide separate facilities for men and women in their asylums until 1928. Poorhouses allowed criminals and prostitutes to produce all manner of weak-minded delinquents and bastards, he believed. Finally, Davenport's anti-rural bias was especially potent. The survival of the fittest model he subscribed to, subscribed to emphasized migration from the countryside to the city. As the fitter people moved, the weaker strains remained behind. All, almost all eugenicists analogized human and animal breeding. Davenport described the best female breeders as women with large hips, using the same thinking that animal breeders had employed for centuries to describe cows. The biggest donor to the eugenics record office was Miss Mary Harriman, widow of the railroad magnet Averill Harriman. She came from a family of avid horse breeders. Alexander Graham Bell imagined rearing, quote, human thoroughbreds, saying for generations of superior parents would produce one thoroughbred. A wealthy New York horse breeder, William Stokes, published a eugenics book in 1917 and went so far as to contend that Americans could be bred to class, guaranteeing that intellectual capacity matched one's station. He popularly argued the right of the unborn to be, well, be healthy. Why should one's generation be punished for the bad breeding choices of the parents? Three solutions in, uh, arose in the effort to cull American bloodlines. As an animal breeding, advocates pushed for legislation that allowed doctors and other professionals to segregate and quarantine the unfit from the general population, or they called for the castration of criminals and the sterilization of diseased and degenerate classes. If that seems a gross violation of human rights in any age, a Michigan legislator went a step further in 1903 when he proposed that the state should simply kill off the unfit. This is in America, folks, by the way. Another eugenics advocate came up with a particularly ludicrous plan to deal with a convicted murderer, execute his grandfather. 
Such proposals were not merely fringe ideas. By 1931, 27 states, 27 states had sterilization laws on the books, along with an unwieldy 34 categories delineating the kinds of people who might be subject to, sur to the surgical procedure. Eugenicists used a broad brush to create an underclass of the unfit, calling for the unemployable to be, quote, stamped out, as Harvard professor Frank William Tussing wrote in Principles of Economics, 1921. If society refused to subject hereditary misfits, irretrievable criminals and tramps, to, quote, chloroform once and for all, then the professor fumed they could at least prevent from propagating their kind. Eugenicists were divided over the role women should play in the national campaign. Some insisted that they remain guardians of the hearth. This ideal coincided with the traditional Southern ethos that asserted planter and middle-class women should uh, possess a natural aversion to associating with black men. The New York horse breeder Stokes called on women to scrutinize potential suitors, demanding family pedigrees and subjecting the man to a physical examination. It's easy to see how he borrowed from the horse breeder's demand for pedigree papers, not to mention the proverbial gift horse mouth inspection. It became popular for young women to pledge a eugenic marriage, accepting no man who did not meet her high scientific standards. In 1908, a concerned female teacher in Louisiana started Better Baby Contests in which mothers allowed their offspring to be examined and graded. This program expanded into fitter family competitions at state fairs. The contestants were held in the stock grounds and families were judged in the manner of cattle. The winners received medals, not unlike prize bulls. Educated women were the gatekeepers, the guardians of eugenic marriages, though fecund poor women continued to outbreed their female betters. Uh, fecund means, you know, fertile. So-called experts contended that those who overindulged in sexual activity and lacked intellectual restraint were more likely to have feeble children. Here they were imagining poor whites fornicating in the bushes. Once experts like Davenport identified harlotry and poverty as inherited results, sexually aggressive women of the lower classes were viewed as the carriers of degenerate germ protoplasm. In 1910, Henry Goddard, who ran a testing laboratory at the School for Feeble-Minded Boys and, G and Girls in Vineland, New Jersey, invented a new eugenic classification, the moron. More intelligent than idiots and imbeciles, morons were especially troublesome because they could pass as normal. Female morons could enter polite homes as servants and seduce young men or be seduced by them. It was thought to be a real problem. The fear of promiscuous poor women led eugenics reformers to push for the construction of additional asylums to house feeble-minded white women. In this effort, they de deployed the term segregation, the same as was used by Southerners to enforce white-black separation. The passing female was not a new trope either. It borrowed from other Southern fear of the passing mulatto who might marry into a prominent family. Passing also conjured the old English fears of the class interloper and the unregulated social mobility, the house servant seducing the lord of the manor. Passing means to pass as one of the your quote unquote betters. Even with such racial overtones, the major target of eugenicists was the poor white woman. Goddard's description of the female moron as one lacking forethought, vitality, or any sense of shame perfectly replicated reconstructed writer's portrayal of white trash. Davenport felt the best policy was to quarantine dangerous women during their fertile years. How this policy prescription led to sterilization is rather more calculated. Interested politicians and eager reformers concluded that it was cheaper to operate on women than to house them in asylums for decades. Southern eugenicists in particular argued that sterilization helped the economy by sending poor women back into the population safely neutered, but still able to work at menial jobs. World War I fueled the eugenics campaign. First of all, the army refused to issue soldiers prophylactics, condoms. The top brass insisted that sexual control required a degree of internal discipline, which no army program would effectively inculcate. The army, along with native local anti-vice groups, anti-prostitution groups, rounded up some 30,000 prostitutes and placed as many as, po in, as possible in detention centers and jails, where they were kept out of the reach of soldiers. Thus, the federal government backed a policy of sexual segregation of quote-unquote tainted women. At the same time, advocates for the draft argued that a volunteer force would be both unfair and uneugenic. Senator John Sharp of Mississippi insisted that without a draft, only the best blood would go to the front, leaving behind those inferior mold uh, to beget the next race. The war advanced the importance of an intelligence testing. 
Goddard had created the, quote, moron classification by using the Binet-Simon test, which was succeeded by the IQ test, uh, promoted by Stanford Professor Lewis Terman, and then it was used by the U.S. Army. The Army's findings only served to confirm a long-held, unpropitious view of the South, since both poor white and black recruits from the southern states had the lowest IQs. Overall, the study found that the mean intelligence of the soldier registered at the moron level, the equivalent of a, quote, normal 13-year-old boy. Given the results, observers wondered if poor white men were dragging down the rest of the nation. The lack of public education funding in the South made the Army's intelligence test results inevitable. The gap in education levels matched what had existed between the North and the South before the Civil War. Many of the men who took the test had never used a pencil before. Southern white men exhibited stunted bodies. Army medical examiners found them to be smaller, weaker, and less physically fit. National campaigns to fight hookworm and pellagra, both associated with clay eating and identified as white trash diseases, only reinforced this portrait. Beginning in 1909, the New York-based Rockefeller Institute poured massive amounts of money into philanthropic programs aimed at eliminating hookworm, while the U.S. Public Health Service tackled pellagra. The Rockefeller Foundation published shocking pictures of actual hookworm subjects, some pairing boys the same age, one normal and the other literally dwarfed and disfigured by the disease. It didn't help the South's image that hookworm was spread by lack of sanitation. Outhouses were rare among the Southern poor, let alone toilets. I mean, they didn't even have outlets. They didn't even have outhouses. All in all, the rural South stood out as a place of social and now eugenic backwardness. Tenant farmers and sharecroppers wandering the dusty roads with a bulky mule seemed a throwback to the 18th century vagrants. The lazy diseases of hookworm and plague created a class of lazy lovers. Illiteracy was widespread. Fear of indiscriminate breeding loomed large. The stock of poor white men produced in the South were dismissed as unfit for military service, the women unfit to be mothers. In the two decades before the war, reformers had exposed that many poor white women and children worked long, grueling hours in southern textile factories. Was this another sign of race suicide? He asked, could there possibly produce future generations of healthy, courageous, intelligent, and fertile Americans? For many in the early 20th century, then, the new race problem was not the Negro problem. It was instead a different crisis, one that was caused by a worthless class of antisocial whites. It was Albert Pretty who called the poor white Virginians the shiftless, ignorant, and worthless class of antisocial whites of the South. He was the superintendent of the state colony for epileptics and feeble-minded in Lynchburg, Virginia. He helped shape the op optimal legal test case for sterilization, a case that went to the Supreme Court in Buck v. Bell, 1927. Pretty began building his case in 1916, targeting prostitutes. He recruited top eugenics experts, including two colleagues of Davenport's with ties to the eugenics record office in the Carnegie Institution of Washington. Pretty also had the support of the University of Virginia School of Medicine, which took the lead in eugenic science and public policy. Dean Harvey Ernest Jordan saw <clears throat> Virginia as the perfect laboratory for comparing the best Virginia's famed first families and the worst stocks of poor whites. In 1912, he proposed intelligence testing of white, black, and mulatto children. He found a way to pervert the meaning of a classic phrase of the university's founder, Thomas Jefferson, into eugenic nonsense. Man does not have an inalienable right to personal or reproductive freedom, if such freedom is a menace to society. <clears throat> inalienable rights were now the inherited privileges of the superior classes, what Jordan called Americans, America's human thoroughbreds. Eugenicists made Virginia the national test case for weeding out bad blood. Pretty recruited Arthur Eastbrook of the Carnegie Institution to his, to his campaign, getting him to offer in the Virginia courts his expert opinion on intelligence testing. But this colleague of Davenport spread the eugenics message in yet another way. In 1926, Estabrook published Mongrel Virginians, a study of an isolated mountain community in Virginia known as the Wind Tribe. The Winds offered a curious case of inbreeding and interracial breeding. They were of, quote, mixed races, neither black nor white, largely Indian. The portrait was damning. The community Estabrook described suffered from congenital ignorance, all springing from the licentiousness of mixed-race women. Their habit of breeding was, in his words, almost that of an animal in their freedom. The evidence in Mongrel Virginians was sufficient to guide passage of the Racial Integrity Act of 1924, which prohibited marriages between blacks and whites and treated Indian blood no differently from black blood. 
The Virginia law defined a white person as having, quote, no trace of any but Caucasian blood. Following the agenda of the eugenicists, the first draft of the law required a racial registry tracking pedigrees in order to ensure that no light-skinned black with Indian blood might marry a white person. This regulation was removed from the final version of the bill, but the law still divided the population into white and black, fit and unfit, pure and tainted bloodlines. In the end, Virginia legislators believed that they had immunized the population against mongrelism at the altar. It had stopped the contagion that passed from blacks and Indians to poor whites and up the hierarchy to the unsuspecting white middle class and elites. Three years later, Chief Justice Oliver Wendell Holmes would offer a revolutionary decision in Buck v. Bell, which gave the state the power to regulate the breeding of its citizens. Like Justice Taney in the Dred Scott decision, he believed that pedigree could be used to distinguish worthy citizens from the waste people. He ruled that sterilization was the appropriate recourse in order to curb generations of imbeciles from reproducing. Holmes argued that sterilization was a civic duty, saving the nation from being swamped with incompetence. He echoed what the English had argued in the 1600s. The unfit would either starve or become executed for some crime, so sending them to be sterilized was the humane option, as being sent to the colonies had been centuries before. Carrie Buck of Buck v. Bell had been chosen for sterilization on the order of pretty because she was one of, quote, these people that, quote, worthless class of Southern whites. She was, in a word, a perfect specimen of white trash. While Carrie Buck was the plaintiff, her mother and daughter were on trial too. Carrie tested at the moron level, quote unquote, and her mother slightly lower, according to the highly biased experts. Her illegitimate child, examined at seven months, was termed feeble-minded. This was based on the observations of a Red Cross worker and on a test administered by Estabrook. The experts' degree chart proved degeneracy as well as sexual deviance. Carrie's mother was a prostitute, and Carrie had been raped by the nephew of her adoptive parents. Her rapist went unpunished, yet she was sterilized. Eugenics suffused the culture of the 20s. Social classes were ranked according to the levels of their inheritable potential. At the top was the new professional master class. Many believed that intelligence was inherited and that tests of school children proved that the, that the brightest pupils were those whose parents were highly educated professionals. This elite had to be not just mentally, but also physically fit. At the Second International Congress of Eugenics in New York in 1921, two statues were put on display at opposite ends of Darwin Hall in the Museum of Natural History. One was a composite of biometric measures of the 50 most athletic men at Harvard, the other an amalgam of 100,000 doughboys from World War I, in other words, the average American male. The Harvard specimen was the decidedly more impressive of the two, and a new word was coined for the cognitive elite, aristogenic what we would call a genetic leadership class. One was once again born to a station, as in the traditional meaning of aristocracy, but it was not because of family name or wealth. Now it was the endowment of inborn qualities that marked off the superior class. While eugenicists made it fashionable to celebrate a hereditary ruling class, they were as bent on organizing social classes on the basis of breeding capacity. One of the most popular eugenics lecturers, C.W. Salaby, spoke up for something called eugenic feminism, insisting that the brightest women should not only take up the suffrage cause for the right to vote, but also accept their patriotic duty to breed. He imagined female societies organizing as a bee colony. The queens of superior stock bred throughout their fertile years, while educated sterile women or postmenopausal were best suited for reform activity. Professor William McDougall of Harvard came up with an equally radical solution. He called for a breeding colony of Eugenia, of a separate protectorate within the United States in which the best and brightest would propagate a superior stock. Eugenia would be at once a university and a stud farm. Raised as aristocrats in the tradition of noblesse oblige, the products of the special colony would go on out into the world as skilled public servants. The obsession with white trash did not lose any attraction in the 1920s. Reformers, again, progressive reformers, right, and legislators pushed their campaigns while journalists wrote sensational newspaper stories and published shocking photographs. The Supreme Court ruling in Buck v. Bell inspired Mississippi, North Carolina, South Carolina, and Georgia to pass sterilization laws similar to the one adopted in Virginia. Protecting and promoting good blood would mean little if removing bad blood did not receive the same attention. The decade also saw the appearance of a new generation of novelists who experimented with eugenist ideas. One of these, very, the very popular Sherwood Anderson, stood out. He composed semi-autobiographical tales of small-town life, publishing the unmistakably titled Poor White in 1920. 
His character, Hugh McEvey, is a son of white trash, born in a hole of the town on a muddy bank along the Mississippi in Missouri. His nature is that of a listless dreamer, his sleepy mind unable to fix on anything important. He is saved from his animal-like stupor when the railroad comes through town, bringing a fresh-faced New England-born Michiganer in whose veins flowed the blood of the pioneers and who becomes his schoolteacher. Almost Rousseau-like, she stimulates in him a new intellectual vitality. <clears throat> Wanting to escape his past and rise socially, Hugh leaves the South behind. He wanders from town to town for three years, eventually settling in Bridewell, Ohio. There, after he takes a job in a telegraph office, technology shapes his destiny, and his dreamy nature blossoms into what the reader recognizes as good old-fashioned American ingenuity. He invents a series of machines, the most successful of which is the McIvey corn cutter. Transformed into a hero in his adoptive industrializing town, Hugh meets the rebellious Clara Butterfield, a college-educated feminist-leading woman. She chooses him for a husband in an act of eugenic marital selection, preferring what she describes as a kind horse to a wolf or a wolfhound. It is the force of reproduction that ultimately saves the couple from the tensions that arrive amid the surge of modern life. After facing various dangers, Hugh becomes the dark and brooding when he starts to see the machine age as nihilistic and futile. His wife pulls him back from the brink of insanity by reminding him of the son she carries in her belly. Feeling a primitive animal impulse to reproduce allows him to carry on. Anderson's novel rejected the jingoistic optimistic of the 19th century, but it also pointed to the eugenic idea that poor whites suffered from childish impotence or arrested development, requiring the reactivation of their better Saxon qualities. Facing challenges, Hugh never reaches the level of hopelessness that infuses Erskine Caldwell's first novel, The Bastard. Caldwell was a son of a minister in Georgia, and his father was sympathetic to eugenics. The Bastard seeks to prove that no human can hide from his inborn traits from the imprint of his ancestors. Cadwell's protagonist is Jean Morgan. Eugene comes from the same root of Wellborn as Eugenic. Our ironically named hero is a bastard. He learns that his harlot mother was murdered in Louisiana. Her belly slit open like a swamp, an allusion to the polluted wasteland inside her from which she was spawned. He was spawned. Jean is a vicious white, a wanderer, and his only pleasure comes from violence. Raised by an old Negro woman and sexually attracted to a mulatto girl, he thoughtlessly transgresses the color line. Gene is lost until he meets Myra Morgan, a clean, feminine woman. They marry and move to Philadelphia, where he works hard to support his new wife and the baby that soon comes along. The parents watch to their horror as their child transforms into a freak. His body is covered with black hair, like that of a wild animal, proving that the taint of the swamp is still present in his blood, despite Myra's purity. The doctor tells her that she can expect all of her children to be degenerate, leaving a clear message. The bastard Gene is congenitally cursed. There are hints of inbreeding since Jean and Myra have the same last name. He contemplates murdering his son, but doesn't go through with it. He leaves his beloved wife, hoping she will marry a normal man. The rising generation of new, modern century saw little of enduring substance in family dynasties of the Gilded Age. All they had to speak of was their money. In place of America's imperfect aristocracy, progressive reformers were eager to rear a cognitive thinking elite, one that could deal with the modern technology and bureaucracy. Class continued to matter greatly, but it wasn't going to be the flamboyant aristocracy of the effete old world that would monitor modernity. Hope lay instead with a cadre of men in white lab coats and bureaucrats in tailored suits. Professional expertise would be convincing enough to uh, enough evidence of inborn merit. It should seem odd to us that the high tide of eugenics coexisted with the storied glamour of the Roaring Twenties, Lindbergh's transatlantic flight, lighthearted flappers, and unpoliced speakeasies. Yet even the flappers were warned that their daring dancing style too closely resembled the ways of those of the, uh, who had gypsy, i.e. black blood. They would be better served to settle down with a eugenically suitable mate. If ever there was a time when class consciousness sank deep roots, this was it. The 1920s saw social exclusiveness masquerade as science and disdain for rural backwardness and the mongrel taint intensify. In a culture under siege, white trash meant impure and not quite white. Like the moron who somehow passed into the middle class, the ill-bred bastard gave a watchful people a new set of social hazards to look out for, while they listened to the stock ticker and marched off a cliff with the market crash in 1929. So I ask you guys to consider the change in continuity. Is eugenics an outcome of the progressive mentality of trying to reform society, or does it more properly belong in the 1920s? Now, we'll start the 1920s very shortly, uh, but consider how, while not all progressives are eugenicists, how does eugenics fit into the progressive mentality?